All right. So uh, it is my wonderful pleasure to uh, introduce to you uh, Dr. Leif Richardson, who is a conservation biologist with the Xerxes Society for Invertebrate Conservation, where he runs the California Bumblebee Atlas, which is a three-year community science project to survey the diversity and distribution of the state's more than 25 bumblebee species. Leif's work focuses on interactions between species, in particular, in particular those involving bees, their parasites, and the plants that they pollinate. He also studies agricultural pollination, the effects of pesticides on bee populations, on bee pollinators and the causes and consequences of bee species declines. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand that over, hand it over to Dr. Leif. Thank you so much for being here. Sorry, Dr. Richardson, and you can take it away. Thank you, Elliot. That's great. Um, thank you very much um, for that warm introduction. And uh, I'm really glad to be with you all. I'm well, I'm aware, I've been aware for some time of, of um, the the programs that you all are involved with and um uh think that are wonderful and so i was really excited to have this opportunity to present to you about bumblebees um, and their relationships with plants and other organisms um, i think it's a great fit for some of the work that you do um, and i'm going to try to make the case towards the end of this talk that uh, you should consider bumblebees when you think about uh, if, you, if you're a, a, a uc naturalist program student or UC climate steward student, uh, you should think about bumblebees um, and their plants uh, for your capstone projects or your thesis projects. I think that they'd be a wonderful um, way to go. So um, the talk is entitled California Bumblebees Ecology, Distribution and Declines. And I will cover those things roughly speaking. Um, I will also be talking a bit about the California Bumblebee Atlas and welcoming, welcoming you to participate in that as a volunteer. It's an exciting uh, project that we have underway in, in year one here, um, and it's a lot of fun for the volunteers. Uh, so as I go through this, most of the photos are my own. Um, I've indicated where they're not, and I will try to remember to tell you the name of each species. These are native California bumblebee species, so I'll try to give you a sense of who's who. Um, I usually speak Latin when I'm talking about bumblebees. I will try to remember the common names, which are not as commonly used as the Latin names. So this is Morrison's bumblebee or Bombus morrisoni, uh, a declining species found broadly in the West and um, especially in Eastern California, not so much elsewhere in the state. So uh, before we get started with the bumblebees, I wanna quickly tell you a little about the Xerces Society my, uh, for Invertebrate Conservation, my employer. Um, we protect wildlife through the conservation of invertebrates and their habitats. We do that through five different program areas. That includes native pollinators, endangered species, aquatic invertebrates, butterflies, and pesticides. And my work happens mainly in the endangered species program uh, where I work on bumblebees. Uh, at Xerces, we do a lot of community science, as you are probably aware. Um, given uh, uh, that you're involved with this program. Um, we do, we have program, we have projects involving bumblebees, obviously, but also uh, counting freshwater mussels and dragonflies. We've got uh, monarch butterfly counts in the winter, as well as monarch milkweed host plant uh, mapping and a range of other things. So if you're interested in getting in involved in new community science endeavors, please visit our website and check out the community science page. For more. And this is a very brief uh, slide to plug the California Bumblebee Atlas, one such community science project. I'll talk more about it at the end of this 30 minute set of slides, um, but I just want to put it in your mind now. It is, it is community science, sometimes known as citizen science, a project that's a collaboration of Xerces and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife or CDFW. Um, and basically we're doing a, a stratified bumblebee inventory across the state over the next three years, including this year. Um, it's non-lethal, so volunteers or participants learn uh, methods for safely uh, catching, handling, anesthetizing, photographing, and then releasing the bees unharmed. Um, so more about that as uh, after we talk more about bumblebees. And finally about Xerces, um, we are a nonprofit supported significantly by donors, both small and large, and we appreciate that support. So I just want to make you aware of, of um, that. And there's a link there if you choose to donate. Thank you. So uh, I've divided this into four brief sections, uh, and you'll see this slide four times. 
Um, and so the sections are going to be first uh, a conversation about bees and the plants that they interact with. Second, I'll talk more deeply about bumblebees and their biology. Then I'll talk about some of the threats and stressors that are causing some bumblebee species to decline. And then finally, I'll talk about some of the approaches that we uh, at Xerces and beyond are using to conserve remaining populations and also to restore habitat for bumblebee populations. So let's get into these, uh, these bumblebees and other bees and their, and their plants. Um, so as you are no doubt aware, pollinators are critical to plant communities. Pollinators are those insects that help plants uh, with sexual reproduction, right, with the production of seeds um, following flowering. Uh, and without those pollinators, we would see uh, great, uh, very significant shifts in vegetation over time, right? With certain plants don't need any pollinator, any help from an animal, but others are uh, are entirely bound up in turn in uh, in their reproduction with some some animal, be it a bee or something else. And so we really need. Uh, pollinators of all sorts, including bees, especially bumblebees, um, uh, in this context, as pollinators. And of course, um, um, it's no joke, uh, they are actually working away in habitats like this. For example, this uh, Bombus mixtus, uh, working on uh, an Areogonum or buckwheat species in a dune system um, outside of Eureka, California, last week where I was doing field work. Um, and so I think that you all probably know more than the average person about pollination, but just in case, I want to I get us all on the same page about what is pollination. Uh, so pollination, simply put, is how plants uh, reproduce sexually, uh, right? And so it's the movement of, of male gametes or male sex cells from the male parts of the flowers to the female parts of the flowers. And here we see a nice diagram of a flower that contains both male parts, for example, the filament an anther, which, which comprised the stamen, and then female parts, including the, the uh, stigma up at the top there, um, the style, the elongated thing that, that leads down to the ovary, which contains the egg cells. And so pollination can be uh, passive, where uh, plant parts are um, designed by evolution to interact so that pollen is dropped right onto the female parts, the, the stigma namely. Um, but more commonly, uh, plants uh, outcross, they, they, they reproduce with other individuals in the population. And most of the time, cross-pollination involves an insect, uh, sorry, an animal that mediates the, the pollen transfer, um, usually an insect. Um, you're probably familiar that, uh, with the fact that some plants can, can um, be pollinated by passive means, such as wind or uh, water even. And these are evolved mechanisms of pollination that just don't depend on animals. Um, so that's pollination. Bumblebees are very important pollinators. Uh, I like to call them keystone species. That is a species with, or a group of species without which uh, an ecosystem would experience uh, a cascade of changes, um, many of them negative, a loss of plant diversity, uh, a loss of those, uh, those participants to the interactions like pollination. So uh, studies have shown that about 85% of all of the flowering land plants require an animal to lesser or greater degree to uh, to affect pollination, to uh, realize the, the largest reproduction that they can do. So some of those plants in that 85% are only partially dependent on, on bees or other insects or other animals, uh, but, but nonetheless, they do better when they're pollinated by an animal. Um, bees are also, so that's that's wild plants out in, out in nature, but bees are also uh, critical to crop pollination. And here I'm not uh, so much talking about managed bees like honeybees, I'm talking about the wild bees. So uh, whatever one does on a farm um, at, around the world, we tend to see that, um, that the native bees and other native insects come to the farm to uh, gather resources from, from crop plants, thereby pollinating them. Uh, about 10% of the total value of agriculture in the U.S. is due to pollination, uh, whether by managed bees or wild bees. And this means if you removed all of the bees and you still tried to grow the same crops, um, we would lose a, a large fraction of the total economic return of agriculture. And we would also lose um, uh, the diversity in our diets. We would um, suffer uh, nutritionally because uh, many of the pollinator uh, sorry, the pollinator dependent crops um, are the ones that, that have more phenolics and flavonoids and other antioxidant uh, compounds that are healthy for us. 
Um, surprisingly, at least to me, when this, this study came out, um, wild bees provide the majority of pollination to agriculture around the world, whether or not managed honeybees are present. So what this means is that across many studies, this, this research group um, looked for averages and they found that on average in pollination studies of crop systems, the wild insects, especially bees, were the most important pollinators of the crop, whether or not the farmer was paying for honeybees to be present. It's not to say that honeybees are worthless. Um, it's to say that uh, the crop pollination is often dependent on wild animals. And most of us are unaware of that. Most of the farmers are not aware of that. And in most cases, we're not managing the land to um, to benefit those pollinators, right? We, we think critically about bringing bees to the field to increase yield, but we don't think very much about managing the habitat or the, um, the, the local environment to, to support those native insects, including uh, native bumblebees. Uh, this paper was a landmark study. It's not the only one of its kind, but I, I usually get questions about it. So I've put a little um, URL at the bottom of the page there if you're interested to go read the whole thing yourself. The author's name is Garibaldi and the year was 2013 and it's in the journal of science. I normally won't give you that much detail about it, out of, about a reference if I use one, but feel free to ask later. So uh, I want to, before moving further, I want to make sure everyone's clear that, that bees are not the only important pollinators. Uh, uh, they are functionally the most significant pollinators of plants, both wild and cultivated. We'll discuss why in just a minute. But of course we have these other species. We have uh, beetles in the upper left-hand corner um, seen interacting with a, a milkweed flower um, that are pollinators of plants such as this. Um, we have butterflies and moths to the right there. The lower left-hand corner, we see some bee flies. These are flies uh, and they're important pollinators that actually eat pollen. Uh, that's sort of unusual for flies. Many of them are nectar drinkers, but not so many eat the pollen. Uh, to the right of that is a fascinating wasp. Uh, it's a macerine wasp or pollen wasp. And these wasps um, have, uh, they're one of the, they are the only lineage of wasps that have lost the taste for, um, for animal protein and feed pollen to their offspring, just like bees. Um, so bees, of course, um, including bumblebees are, are the most important in terms of functional significance uh, as pollinators. Uh, bumblebees uh, are often thought of as one of the, the superior pollinating groups. And I'll talk a, a little bit here about why. Well, the first thing is they are, are they are dependent on flowers for their food, like many other, most other bees. Um, so they consume nectar uh, as a source of carbohydrates and they consume pollen as a source of protein. And they return to their nests with, pro, with, with pollen as the protein source for rearing their own offspring. Um, and that is, as I was referencing on, on the last slide, that is to be contrasted with wasps who normally, except for the one exception that I showed you there, um, who normally feed animal protein to their offspring. Um, so think about, maybe you're familiar with wasps that are spider hawks. They, they, they capture and um, um, paralyze spiders and take them home, or they may uh, capture grasshoppers and bring them home. In almost every wasp, it is meat that they're feeding to their offspring. Every ant, it's meat. And these are the closest relatives of, uh, of bees. Bees are different. They switched um, um, at some point in, in their evolutionary history to using plants as the protein source. So obviously they're going to flowers to get their food. Uh, they're not going to flowers to pollinate. That's an incidental uh, outcome of them foraging for their food. But bees and plants have this long co-evolved relationship that is based on the fact that plants need a ride <laughs> to get their male uh, sex cells to their female sex cells and uh, bees need a, need, need a meal. So this is a mutualism. Uh, it's also a, you could think of it as a reciprocal parasitism. Uh, they're both in it for their own self good, their, their, their own self interest. Um, and, and this wonderful pollination does take place, okay? So bumblebees and other bees do have all these adaptations for, for harvesting and carrying and processing nectar and pollen. And this shows us that they can be good pollinators. So circled in red here, we see the, the pollen basket, uh, a hairless and extended concave area of the hind leg that the bee uses to carry pollen home. Um, you can see the bee is very hairy. And she has multiple uh, appendages on, on legs and, and 
um, parts of her mandibles that help her process pollen. Um, so bees uh, like this tend to be very good at transferring pollen between flowers as they go about their foraging for their own food resources. Here are some other reasons that bees make good pollinators. Um, I've talked about that key adaptation of using pollen rather than animal protein as a protein source. Um, but and, and there are many other morphological adaptations outside of the bumblebees that you may hear about or, or know about. Um, many bees have long tongues, um, some of them bumblebees, some of them not. Um, some of them carry the pollen on the underside of the abdomen, like this megachylid bee um, in the bottom left-hand corner, as opposed to on the hind leg, like, like in the bumblebee on the bottom right. Uh, they have branched hairs, as you can see in this, this uh, scanning electron microscopy photo. Um, those, those, uh, those branches actually increase the static cling of the pollen, and you get a better ability to carry pollen home. Um, and also some of them will carry pollen and they all carry nectar internally back to the nest. So lots of adaptations for interacting with plants. Before diving deeply into bumblebees, I want to uh, just give you a sense of where they are in terms of the diversity of bees generally. Um, so around the world, we know there are uh, uh, more than 20,000 named species of bees, and the naming continues. Uh, I asked a taxonomist recently, and uh, he told me he thought maybe we'd get to uh, uh, 21,000 or something like that eventually. So the number of bees is steadily ticking up, even as we are likely losing some to extinction um, for reasons related to another species, us. Um, but over 20,000 is, is the number. In North America, that's more than 5,000 species, including the US, Canada, and Mexico. Um, and, uh, and so this is a large diversity. By contrast, around the world, there are fewer than 300 species of bumblebees. So bumblebees are not typical bees. Um, they're large and furry and social. Uh, in, a, in a number of ways, they just aren't like the average bee. So um, the average bee uh, is a solitary bee. They're not social, they, they, they mate. And then the females uh, found a nest, lay eggs, provision the eggs, um, close up the nest, and she never meets uh, the offspring, um, and and then never meets another male until the next, uh, unless there's there's a mating, uh, a need to mate. There is no caste division or anything like that in those bees. Another thing that's very interesting about this is that bumblebees are generalists in their pollen preferences. They will eat many, just hundreds of different types of plants, native and non-native, um, but fully um, somewhere between roughly 25% uh, of all bees are specialists that depend on one single plant species or maybe one genus or maybe one family or subfamily of plants. So they're legume bees or they are bees that only use a particular species of poppy in the Eastern Mojave. Um, so they're specialized on, on a plant and so they're dependent on the, the, the well-being of the, the plant populations, right? And bumblebees, have options, they can go elsewhere. So before moving on, I just want you to see this great uh, diversity of form and hear me talking about the diversity of function. Just understand that social, highly social, large hairy bees are that eat just about anything are not as typical, not so typical of the full complement of uh, bee biodiversity. Um, and I wanna distinguish bumblebees from honeybees here. So you're no doubt familiar with honeybees. Uh, the Western honeybee, sometimes referred to as the European honeybee, is a Eurasian species that we brought here in the 18th century for pollination um, on the East Coast, and it spread eastward, um, eventually reaching California. I think it may have been introduced separately um, in California also. In any case, we have, um, we have honeybees as managed pollinators and um, as bees that we keep for honey and wax and other hive products. Um, and we also have naturalized populations of honeybees, but these are not a native insect. They are not a co-evolved partner of plants in North America, uh, and they are not an environmental concern in terms of conservation. We don't need to conser conserve um, honeybees, uh, regardless of what you have read or heard in the media. Um, honeybees are doing better than ever. Uh, they have lots of problems, as if you know, no doubt heard, but they are not at risk of extinction. Uh, in fact, we are making more and more hives every year. So, um, so there's that. And then also, I just want you to look at the form here. This is the same plant. And uh, the one on the right is, is Bombus terricola, which is a, a yellow-banded bumblebee, not found in California, um, but it's larger and hairier than the average worker cast 
on EB, and you can see those color pattern differences. Um, so just so you have a frame of reference for what the most common bee around your house might be, the honeybee, um, as a little bit different from, from the bees that we're talking about today. So let's talk more about how bumblebees get, uh, get through a, a year of their lives. What is their life history like? Um, what are their interactions like? What is the sociality like? And so on. Uh, so, uh, first of all, I've told you a little bit about global biodiversity of bumblebees. Now I want to show you where the bees are in North America and where they aren't. Um, this is a figure from um, the 2015 Bumblebees of North America, which is a book I'm a co-author on. Um, and this figure just shows you how many species of bumblebees have been recorded in each of these equal area grid cells. Um, and the highest number uh, we know of is 24, and that's, that would be in Northern California, as well as in uh, Northwestern Montana. So the hotspots for North American bumblebee uh, biodiversity, those would be Northern California, uh, the Sierras, and, uh, and the, the Rocky Mountains um, through Colorado and, and Montana. Uh, so um, this, is, this is nice. In California, we have about half of the continent's bumblebee species native and resident here. Um, and so California is a special spot if you're thinking about a conservation of these types of bees. I will say that the solitary bees, the other types of bees, the diversity patterns look different than this. They are the most diverse in uh, Mediterranean climates, desert climates. Uh, the desert Southwest is one of the most biodiverse areas for bees globally, but not necessarily for bumblebees. Bumblebees are more uh, temperate animals. They, they like high elevation and more uh, music or wet areas. Um, they're not especially fond of low desert, for example. Um, so bumblebees are social insects, meaning uh, they live in a colony where the individuals are related to each other, and some of the individuals do not reproduce. Instead, they help their mother uh, to uh, rear her offspring, and by so doing, they experience this, this um, group uh, selection or kin selection, right? They're helping rear their siblings, and their own genes are being passed on as a result. That's, this is why these things can evolve over time. And so let's look at this life cycle diagram here. Um, starting at number one, that would be springtime in a temperate place. Um, in California, that might be January, it might be April, depending on where you are. Uh, queen bumblebees emerge from hibernation, which we'll discuss in a second. Uh, they've already made it the previous year, and um, their tasks are to find food to feed themselves. Uh, as well as to provision their um, their offspring, then to find a nest site, they need a pre-existing cavity that they cannot dig themselves. So an abandoned rodent burrow or a, a bird nest. Um, usually it's below ground, but it is often above ground, perhaps in a in a bunch grass clump or a a, a sedge, an elevated sedge or rush uh, in in a shallow wetland, for example. Um, so they'll initiate a nest. Uh, at number two there, that's the queen still uh, working solo and she's rearing her offspring and she's got some stored nectar in that pot there. Uh, after about six weeks, the first clutch of eggs uh, emerges as adults. So they go through successive stages, including pupation, just like a butterfly. They emerge as adult uh, worker cast daughters of the queen. So they are female bees. They are not going to reproduce. They're not going to mate. Um, they are instead going to perform nearly all of the, the duties that are required to grow the colony, to rear more offspring, to forage for food, um, and eventually to produce sexual reproductive offspring. Um, that's sort of midsummer, uh, early to midsummer. And then at number four, we see we see mating between the smaller male and the and the queen, the newly emerged queen. So this is not the queen who founded the original colony. Colony. This is one of her daughters. Um, and then after uh, mating, she will feed herself, she will fatten herself up, um, she goes to hibernation with a large store of fat reserves, um, and then she's, she digs a very shallow trench, maybe two inches, this they can dig, um, buries herself alive, and then goes into um, a, a true hibernation state where Differently from, uh, from mammals, um, her temperature will conform to the environment, but she's alive, she's metabolizing, she's able to wake up if necessary, if, if, if uh, the air gets warm enough. Um, and that's the life cycle. A fascinating thing about this social insect, um, which is different from honeybees and many other social insects, is that um, more than half of the year, 
it is not a social insect. It is a solitary insect. It is not a colony. It is an individual. So to the left of the red line, you can now see hibernation at number five, then foraging and, and getting ready to found a nest at number one, founding at number two. Um, those things can take up to nine months of the annual calendar. So it's the queen as a solitary bee who is expressing different genes, is behaving differently, and is a different sort of animal until her worker offspring, her daughters emerge, and suddenly she changes. She stays home. She basically eats and lays eggs and is cared for by her daughters. So I just want to emphasize that when we talk about social insects, there is some fascinating stuff about the solitary phase of the life history that we don't know very much about yet. Um, and it's really important to conserving these bees. So if you're interested in that, I'd be happy to, um, to talk uh, more about that later. One more thing about nesting. Um, there is, uh, if you take the, the bumblebees are in the genus Bombus, and if you break Bombus into the constituent subgenera, um, there is one fascinating group of, of bumblebees, a subgenus of Bombus, that are uh, parasites. They are social parasites of other bumblebees. And in this picture, we see a host bumblebee colony. That's all the waxy stuff there. And I've now labeled for you what the various um, structures are. On the left, you see the hosts. Um, those are worker bumblebees. I, I actually believe that I have got an unlabeled queen on the far left side there, the larger bee. Um, and then uh, the, uh, the bee on the right is not the same species. She does not belong to this colony. She is a, a separate species of cuckoo bumblebee who has uh, dis discovered the nest and entered it. What she's going to do now is destroy all of the eggs larva and pupa in that nest. She's going to fight with the resident bees, probably kill some of them, but, but then um, um, control the rest through pheromones and other sort of latent aggression. And then um, she will force them to rear her offspring. And this colony will produce nothing but, um, but female and male offspring of the cuckoo bumblebee. So this is maybe macabre or something, but it is one way that bumblebees make a living um, as parasites. They're true bumblebees, the real bumblebees. Um, they used to be thought of as something else, but we know they're, they're firmly ensconced in the, in the family tree of bumblebees. Um, they're very interesting animals. I'd, I'd be happy to talk more about them uh, later, um, but I'll just say also about them that this group of bumblebees is, is more imperiled than many other groups, and that is because, we think, um, they are dependent on um, their hosts. So if the host becomes rare, then you might expect the, uh, the, the parasite to be left high and dry with, with, with fewer hosts and, um, and um, no population to depend on. I want to talk a little bit about these brightly colored patterns that we see on bumblebees. Um, and this has to do with us interacting with the bumblebees, it, it, namely, how do we identify bumblebees? On the left, you see a, a panel from that same book I mentioned earlier. Uh, this is uh, showing the distribution of a single species known as Bombus bifarius, or two-form bumblebee. Um, there's, there's some ongoing taxonomic revision for this bee, and you may have heard of Bombus vancouverensis, and that is a section of this bee. I'm not going to talk about it more right now, but just to say that for the, the historically we understood this to be one species. In some parts of the range, they're all black and yellow, for example, in California. In other parts of the range, they have all of this red color in place of black on the abdomen. So if you look um, um, in Colorado, the second and third segments of the abdomen would be extensively red, whereas if you look over in the Sierras, they would be all black. Um, we do get the red forms in extreme Northern California, but I didn't know that when I made this, this figure in uh, 2012 or something. So, um, so this is complicated. As the person trying to identify bumblebees, you need to know where you are and you need to know something about the biogeography of this color pattern problem. Um, problem for us, not for them. So why are they so variable? Why would they look so different um, in different parts of their range? Well, um, it's because of this really interesting um, fact that they, uh, they mimic each other. So through evolution, through natural selection, they, they can change over pretty short timescales to um, display a color pattern that is similar to others in the same environment. And the natural selection event that we hypothesize is driving this is predation. So predators are looking for tasty morsels and bumblebees look great to the naive predator, maybe a blue jay, um, a Stellar's J, let's say, 
um, um, or a dragonfly or something. But once they uh, make a mistake and capture a bumblebee and get a sting, uh, they learn to avoid that color pattern. And you're probably familiar with warning color, uh, coloration or aposomatic coloration, like we see in, in um, coral snakes. You know, these, these bright orange, yellow, black patterns repeat through nature, and they often signal to potential predators that this is a dangerous animal. You're probably also familiar that some animals that don't pack that punch will imitate uh, something dangerous by looking this way. In the case of the bumblebees, they're all potentially dangerous. They all sting, right? But the reason that they want, they quote unquote, want to look similar is that it increases the signal to potential uh, predators hey, all of these animals with bright orange stripes are, uh, are going to sting me in the face. So if I, if I get the signal from one species, I will avoid the second species, if you see what I mean. And so these, these we call these mimicry complexes, and I'm circling three of them that are most common in California. Um, so we get extensively black bees with yellow stripes um, the, the bot, the, on the bottom left, uh, the, the two that I've circled there. Um, and then in the upper right, uh, another variation of mostly black and yellow bees. We do get some of these other bees in this image, but um, just to make the point that they, um, in any given place, they will evolve to look similar to each other. And so if you look back to this image on the far left for Bombus bifarius, the two-form bumblebee, well, um, in coastal California, it looks a whole lot like Vosnesensky bumblebee, the very common one that you probably know. Um, it looks a whole lot like Bombus insularis, one of the cuckoo bumblebees that also occurs there. But over in Colorado, it's going to look a whole lot like um, some of the others that occur there, um, like Melanopagus with bright red color. Um, so um, so these, these guys are challenging to identify. Color patterns are one of the most important traits we have for identifying bumblebees, but it is a faulty set of information and it's very complicated. Um, I, I don't want to dissuade you from getting into this, but it is uh, it becomes challenging to try to sort out the different species when they are all very similar in color pattern in some sites. Leaving behind uh, bumblebee biology, I just want to flag that there, there's still, uh, despite this being a, um, a model organism for the study of sociobiology in the 20th century and um, um, pollinator plant interactions and such, um, there's still much that we don't understand about bumblebees. Um, so I've, I've got a list here of, of places where we need more information um, to help us understand how to conserve bumblebees. So we don't know enough about nesting, we know even less about hibernation, um, where they go and how they handle the cold and how they handle predators in winter. Um, where do queens and males go when they leave the nest? Do they go just right outside and find a mate or do they fly 25 miles? We have, we really, in most cases, can't tell you. We don't know how, what the density of nests is. So it's impossible to tell you how many um, individuals there are in a population or what the effective population size is for thinking about conservation of very rare species. Um, we don't know that much about how reproduction progresses. In particular, male bumblebees are understudied. So we don't understand how um, um, sperm competence uh, matters, whether there are microparasites that live in the spermatheca of the female. We don't know how males behave in many cases or how they find their mates. We don't understand it very well. And then with the threats and stressors, as I'll say later, um, there are lots of question marks. Let's talk about uh, why bumblebees are in peril and, and, and which ones are. Um, you've probably heard that, bum that bumblebees are not doing very well. They're sort of a canary in the coal mine in some people's conception of, of ecosystem, uh, what, what conservation biology in North America and, and um, what ecosystems need. Um, I guess I would be one of those people. I want to show you this a busy but, but um, information packed figure from a recent paper. Um, I may have the year on this one wrong. I think it's 2021. But anyway, uh, this shows the, the globe. Um, and it, for each continent we're, or, or um, area, we're seeing the number of, uh, we're seeing all of the bumblebees divided into, into a pie chart. And we're using um, um, IUCN red list categories. These are risk of extinction categories from the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And it, it ranges from red, which is critically endangered, to endangered, vulnerable, and so on, down to least concern. What I want you to take away from this busy, um, this busy figure is that where we have good data, such as in Europe and North America, 
uh, to some extent in Mesoamerica, about a quarter of all of the bumblebee species um, are threatened to some degree with extinction. They're vulnerable, they're endangered, or they're critically endangered. Um, and then I want you to see that for most of the world, uh, we don't know enough to even make this pie chart yet. Um, the numbers in the countries or continents, I didn't tell you what those were. Those are the number of species of bumblebees that occur in that, in that geography. So for example, look at China, which has 124 bumblebee species. Some of those will occur in Mongolia or in um, Siberia. Okay, but in the country of China, 124 species. And we don't know enough about them those bees yet to say who's imperiled and who's not. Um, we do know that in China, there are some serious problems for bumblebees. Uh, it's even worse in Japan where we don't have so many so, such diversity. Um, so the point is really that where we have done the work, we see troubling patterns of decline and um, in some cases extinction. Where we haven't done the work, uh, we in some cases we know there's a problem, but it, we just don't know yet enough to make a graph like this. Um, so this should have you thinking that um, you know, if this happened in birds or California's native plants or um, bats, we would be raising the alarm about that in a, in a serious way, right? And we are about bees. Everyone knows that bees are in trouble. Um, but this is a really serious um, degree of, of risk, I, I think. Taking this to the level of California, um, where I think most of you are coming from today, uh, we have about 25 species and roughly a quarter of them are in that category of risk that I defined for the globe. Um, here are four uh, among the four that are at greatest risk. And these guys have all been petitioned for listing as endangered under California's Endangered Species Act. Um, you may be familiar with this ongoing legal battle over whether uh, bees are fish. These are the four um, fish like bees. Um, they, uh, so I wanna just tell you briefly about them. These uh, maps come from uh, a recent paper from my colleagues, Rich Hatfield and Serena Jepson. Uh, again, I've got the date wrong, it's 2021. Um, and the maps show in gray circles, the historic observations, usually a specimen, a dead bee on a pin in a, in a Cal Academy drawer or a UC Riverside drawer in the museum. Um, and the black dots represent the last, um, roughly the last, let's see, it's only about six, six years in these maps, but there, that's the recent, the sort of current condition. And so uh, in the upper left-hand corner, you see uh, Crotch's bumblebee, Bombus crotchii, uh, a beautiful and distinctive species that's nearly endemic to the state of California. We know of a single Nevada record and 15 to 20 Baja California records, no other records, they're all in California. And you can see that between the, what I'm defining as a historic period and the recent, there has been a shift in the distribution. Um, the bee is declining in the north in the state, but is still very abundant south of the transverse ranges. Moving to the right, we see Franklin's bumblebee or Bombus franklini. Um, what you can see there is nearly the entire global range for this species. It occurs just in about 120 mile long oval um, stretching across the California Oregon border. And the last observation of this bee was in 2006. It was listed as endangered by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service last year. Um, and uh, I was out searching for it over the last two weeks and did not find it. And so were many other people. And as far as I know, we haven't found it. This is a truly rare species that is possibly already extinct. Uh, moving to the bottom right, that's Bombus sucklii or suckley bumblebee. This one is doing okay in Northern Canada and adjacent Alaska, but um, it has not been seen in California in some time. It was never common here. It was only found in the Trinity Alps, the Siskiyous, um, the Klamath uh, area um, and, and points North. So uh, we may find, we may again discover this being in California, but it is, um, it will be a big surprise and a, a very good one at that. Uh, and finally, Western bumblebee or Bombus occidentalis in the bottom left, this one is currently under um, assessment by U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and a listing decision is expected sometime in 2022. My, I think the smart money is on um, them choosing to list this as either threatened or endangered. It is in serious trouble. And here in California, you can see that it was once very, very common in the San Francisco Bay Area, actually as far south as, um, um, uh, farther south than Salinas, I guess Fort, Fort Hunter, Hunter Liggett, if you're familiar, that is the southernmost observation there. We still find it in the state, but only in the Sierras, the northern Sierras, and uh, very occasionally in, um, in the Trinity Alps. 
Uh, so this is a species where we've, we've really lost uh, a, a common species um, from coastal California that was interacting with our native plants um, as much as any bumblebee back in, back in the mid to late 20th century and, and before. So what's the cause of all of these uh, declines of bumblebees? Um, I'm going to show you this, another very busy graphic from a, a peer-reviewed publication. This is about the so-called insect apocalypse um, that has been written about, about uh, basically that across the world we're seeing steep declines in the, the mass, uh, the abundance of bee uh, insects, as well as the diversity in some studies of insects over the last, uh, depending on the study, 20 to 50 years. Um, and many of these uh, causes that you see on this graphic are, are decline um, factors for bumblebees. Um, so the, the big four uh, that I'll mention are climate change, pesticide exposure, pathogens and disease, and finally habitat loss and fragmentation. Significantly, uh, with, in the, the case with bumblebees is that it's, it's seldom one of these things. It's not just that that endless pesticide application is the reason for the decline of Franklin eye. Um, it's usually a, a combination of these stressors. And in many cases, we can't quite parse which is the most important. Are we missing something? We've addressed a particular stressor and yet we still see ongoing declines. Um, so it's complicated and, um, uh, and multifactorial. I will uh, dive into more detail about two of those four stressors because I think that they are of particular interest to this audience, to you. Um, first, when I say habitat loss, that for me is a, is a large box into which I place subdevelopment, um, paving, impervious services, um, the replacement of native plants with non-native plants that are not uh, useful to bumblebees. Um, wildfire is causing habitat loss. Um, the most salient point to remember about this is that habitat loss means multiple parameters of habitat, but the most important one is the plants themselves. So um, it's wonderful to live in a state where people care so much about native plant conservation. And I just want you to, to realize that native plants are a key, a critical part of the story for, for our native bumblebees. Not because they're wholly dependent on one species. Again, it's not a one-to-one -one symbiosis. Um, but because this is what they're, they're co-evolved with, this is what they eat. Um, some of the non-native plants are quite good for bumblebees, but in many cases, um, uh, so, so as an example, yellow star thistle, a pernicious weed in the state, but bumblebees love it and they should, it's nutritious for them. So it's not a bad uh, replacement for a native areogonum in terms of nutritional quality for bees, perhaps, but it has many other uh, faults and we don't want it on the landscape. Um, there are other non-native plants that are just, they're just useless to bumblebees and they replace other, other things, okay? So um, this is about the food that they eat, but of course we also talk about habitat loss, including loss of nesting substrate and hibernation um, locations. And I wanna talk about climate change um, for you climate stewards and for everybody. So what does that mean? How is climate change impacting bumblebees? I've got three things to show you here. So the, the two graphs are um, their um, sort of social media figures that we made for uh, this paper in 2015, which showed for the first time that bumblebees are changing their biogeography. They're changing their geography uh, where they occur in relation to warming. So not only is the range shifting, and I'll describe how in a second, uh, it is shifting more where um, where the where warming has been the hot the, the steepest so in its existing home range its historic range the 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 pixels on the map that have experienced the highest degree of warming uh, are those places that were most likely to have lost a bumblebee population so if you look at that figure on the bot on the bottom left it is showing and look at the top left quadrant the north america to the top left and on, on the left you see bees in the little graphic and on the right you see plants and the graphic shows them existing in the same latitudinal band. And that's the before condition. And what we're showing on the top right is the effect of climate change as revealed by this paper. So the plants are marching northward as warming progresses. They are moving into newly suitable areas of habitat farther north. And plant populations are by and large still present in the southern extremes of their ranges although that's changing too, right? Plants are disappearing from the hottest places that they, they used to occur in and moving northward. 
for example, um, in the Northeast where I'm from, uh, it's well known that, that sugar, the sugar maple is an important crop plant for um, uh, producing maple syrup. Um, in some 50 to 100 years, we expect it to be largely replaced by, by things like red oak um, coming from the South. Um, so, but, but the graph is trying to show you that um, while the plants are moving northward, the bumblebees are stuck. They are, they are having trouble at the southern extreme of the range. So where it's getting warmer, populations are just... Looks like we may have um, have a brief pause and leave uh, Mrs. Dr. Richardson's presentation with a connectivity issue. So let's give him a few more seconds to get back on here. Um, amazing question so far in the chat. So um, when he gets back on, we'll, um, we'll let him finish his presentation. We may or may not have time for those questions, um, but they are absolutely amazing questions. Um, if you do need to drop off early, there is a link to the uh, evaluation. I'll put that back in here as well. All right, it looks like we may have lost him. That's very unfortunate. What an amazing presentation though. Um, I'll see if you can hop back in for, for a brief moment, uh, but it is uh, about 12.52. So we do understand if you need to get going, um, by all means stick around though, and see if he can hop back on and answer some of those questions and wrap up the presentation. And just another um, plug for the conference. If you uh, have not done so already, check out the information for our 2022 conference up at Tahoe City, October 7th through the 9th. Uh, we have a lot of amazing stuff going on. We have some pretty incredible guest speakers, um, a lot of really fun uh, outdoor activities as well. Um, also, we're celebrating our 10 year anniversary, so we really would love to see you all there. All right, Leafs uh, popping back in. Excellent. All right. Welcome back, Dr. Richardson. <laughs> You're muted. We can't hear you. Very sorry. No worries. Um, died briefly. Um, I am running late here. So let me get right back to the slides and I'm going to try to finish so that we still have some time for questions. I can stay later than one, but I apologize for um, um, where we are. <laughs> so um, I want to move on from the climate the climate change thing. I, I did tell you, um, I was going to tell you, oops, I was going to uh, show you uh, that the, there is a phenological mismatch going on um, between plants, um, bees and their plants. So um, studies have shown that in some cases, we see plants flowering too early for the bees. The bees are emerging too late or um, one is emerging or becoming active before the other. I don't have time to talk more about that now, but I'm happy to later. So let's buzz through a, a few um, slides about conserving bumblebees, about addressing these declines. Um, well, at Xerces, we like to say there are four components of restoring bumblebee habitat, and that would be addressing food resources, as I've, I've discussed here, thinking about shelter, so that would be nesting and overwintering, thinking about connectivity between populations, and then dealing with pesticide exposure. So re removing or uh, greatly reducing their exposure to pesticides. Um, and we need more data on bumblebees. Um, these graphs are meant to show you that for this one species, the Western bumblebee, the, the focus of that listing effort um, in California, um, the ranges have shifted, as I said earlier, but also the predicted ranges are, are just vastly diminished. And, um, and yet we, we don't have enough um, observation points around the state to confidently make the map on the right side of the screen. Um, and so that's where this California bumblebee atlas comes in. It's a wonderful community science project where um, we train you, if you are a volunteer, to, um, to work with bumblebees. You become a, um, a named individual on a, on a permit from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and you collect your own bumblebee data um, in a non-lethal fashion, uh, and you submit it to us at Bumblebee Watch. And I've got a slide here with five quick steps for doing this. Um, and I think we will uh, we'll just wrap up at this slide and I can take questions here um, and you can um, can read this. And if you're interested, you can go to those to those links. Most of them go to our website and one goes to our data upload portal, which is called Bumblebee Watch. So thank you for your patience and I'd be happy to answer questions at this time. 
Uh, thank you for hopping back on. Uh, we had a few questions in the chat. Um, the first one that came up um, was about buzz pollination um, and does being a generalist help with buzz pollination? Mm. Buzz pollination is that behavior where bumblebees and many other types of bees will, will grab a flower and then vibrate their flight muscles to sonicate the flower to, to, to make it shake. And many plants are adapted to this. They, they reserve their pollen except when vibrated. Um, so bumblebees are especially good pollinators for this reason. And again, many native bees can do this, but, uh, but honeybees, for some whatever reason, they, they cannot buzz. Um, this is one reason they're, they're great pollinators. Um, yeah. Excellent. Um, the next one is about um, temperature. So at what temperature uh, do the females emerge from hibernation? Is there a time of year that most bumblebees emerge? It depends on where you are. If you're in a north temperate place, let's say Washington state, you, you would expect them to emerge in spring. So maybe that's March, April, depending on your location. They're active all summer. And then you'd start seeing new queens and males in August, September, even into October. Here in California, the question is difficult to answer because of the diversity of climates we have. So on the coast, you can see a bumblebee any time of year, uh, but farther inland or up in the mountains, we would expect, you know, in spring, we, the, the queens emerge from hibernation, and then we would see the, the colony cycle progress through, um, through the year, through the summer. Awesome. Um, and then the next one, our, our community really uses iNaturalist a lot. So the question is about utilizing iNaturalist. Um, do you use it in your work in any way? And um, is there a specific project that people can join um, to upload bumblebee observations? Uh, I'm a big fan of, of iNaturalist. I use it a lot. I think it's, I think it's wonderful. Um, and, uh, so I, I use it for just about everything except for bumblebees. You, it's obviously great for bumblebee data too. Um, in, instead I use bumblebee watch for uploading my observations of bumblebees. This is because I work for the Xerces society and run a project that's dependent on bumblebee watch. Um, they are different platforms, but do sort of something of the same thing. Um, and all of the data, whether you, you, um, upload your photo to bumblebee watch or iNaturalist, um, I, in my sort of free time, I database, I aggregate bumblebee observation data, and we use this data set for conservation purposes. Whether you put it on a naturalist or bumblebee watch, I will grab that record and put, put it into the database. Um, so um, either one is great for this purpose. But yeah, I think that iNaturalist is, a, is just a hugely important um, um, development. There is, I do have a California bumblebee uh, project, but it's just a, you know, a simple uh, find all the bees that were seen in California kind of thing. Um, it's not an active project that's associated with Xerces or this pro or this um, California bumblebee atlas. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Just kind of collects them as it goes, kind of a passive collector. Yeah. Um, the last one we have is about carpenter bees. Are they a type of bumblebee or just a relation? They're just a relation to both honeybees and bumblebees. They're in the same bee family called apidae. Um, but carpenter bees are sort of subsocial. They live in colonies, as you probably know, and um, they burrow into hardwood, sometimes your house or shed or something. Um, and small family groups live together, uh, usually a mother and just a few daughters and perhaps sons. It's not as highly social as bumblebees. Um, um, and so uh, they, they carry pollen differently. They have a sort of different life history. Um, but we often see them in the same places that we see bumblebees, and they perform many of the same um, you know, ecological roles as bumblebees. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Richardson, we cannot thank you enough for your time today. This was an amazing presentation. Um, so again, thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us and, and telling us all about it. Um, for everyone in uh, on the meeting still, we have we'll put two more links into the chat. One of them is the evaluation uh, for the Cones webinar. It's kind of an ongoing evaluation. So just make sure you have the date in there. Uh, and the other one is for our conference in, up at Tahoe in October 7th through ninth. Um, another huge thank you, Dr. Richardson, and thank you to everyone for being here, and we will see everyone soon. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here and um, putting up with the, the tech issues. I really appreciate it. Please get in touch if you are curious about um, how this connects to your work.
And yeah, I put the Bumblebee Atlas link in there one more time as well. So make sure you open those links uh, before you drop off. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. And uh, we're well, looking forward to seeing you at the conference and have a great rest of your afternoon. Bye, everyone. Mm -hmm.